Button pushed. Button pushed. We're live. People we are going to start are checking live. us out. Check us out, everybody. Yeah, look at this. This is the Fly Fish Food Podcast, number nine. Number Wait, nine. Season one. <laughs> season <laughs> season one. <laughs> one. Okay, Michael Scott. Um, first things first, we have a little bit different format here. Oh, yeah. um, Lance and I are all covered up here, or cuddled up here. I'll turn off the audio yeah, on my computer. Gonna, like, audio. Cheech is messing us up with that audio. <laughs> but huge thanks to Jesse Gonzalez. He built us a table. Yeah. It's solid. solid. It's bomb-proof and uh, looks good. It looks awesome. So, And uh, we're trying to work on our chair setup. <laughs> well, also our wire setup. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Part of the reason he made this for us is so that we could hide all this crap. Yeah. So we'll get there, but we literally got this set up like 30 minutes ago. Yeah. Uh, for those of you who, li- who are listening to the podcast, imagine like a gold and diamond encrusted table with <laughs> fancy <laughs> fixings all all over. Sure. That's what we're sitting at. And Curtis is sitting on a kitchen throne. Lean to the side so they can see that. <laughs> Oops, we're gonna lean that way. Oh. oh, you can't see it. Yeah, it's a wooden wooden stool type chair. Yeah, so we we made Curtis very uh, neighbor's kitchen, 1984, yeah, 1984, mm-hmm. exactly. Probably one of the best years, 1984. <laughs> if you're a Bears fan, <laughs> Ooh. or you like Karate Kid or Ghostbusters, were those 84? I think so. Ooh. Oh my goodness, those what were big movies. are those movies? Stop. Oh my gosh! <laughs> All right, so welcome to podcast episode number nine. We're we're excited to be doing this again, and with uh, any luck, we'll be doing this with a lot more regularity. And with different people. And with different people. Because you will, regardless of of how handsome we are, uh, you will get sick of seeing our faces. (laughs) At some point. (laughs) We're going to start just regurgitating. We're going to become one of those fly tire, fly fishing, not the fly tire magazine, but one of those fly fishing magazines that just regurgitates. (laughs) Old material. Again and again. Anyway, speaking of fly tying, um, and we appreciate it. If you have suggestions for what you want us to talk about, um, go ahead and shoot us Comment an email. Below, Comment email. below, and subscribe and ring the yeah. bell. That's and important. these are podcasted. Yeah. So yeah. iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Stitcher, uh, Libsyn. Yeah. So most, most of the big ones. If so. you're not listening to this, we cannot be held accountable at this point. Yeah. Right. So we make it out there. Yeah, it's we available. we yeah. even yelled at ourselves that we're going to talk into the microphones and we're going to have good audio and all that stuff. Yeah. This new uh, red oh, yeah. box here is the fancy preamp for our microphones. That's pretty awesome. See, so we take this fancy. seriously. Yeah. What were we talking about before we got derailed <laughs> by ourselves? Oh yeah, flies. Flies. Oh yeah. By the way, so comment. Uh, let us know what you want to hear us talk about, except for Euro nymphing. We have that one on the docket. We've heard it. Um, and we're trying to figure out a way that we can do that so it's not repetitive for everybody else because we've, we've talked about it quite a bit yeah. on these. But And we'll talk about it more. We will are, talk uh, about it. There are other techniques. What? what? I know. You're, you're the Euro nymph guy, though, right? Well, that's what everybody tells me. But I like all their techniques, too. I've seen Lance cast a couple times, and yeah, he's good at lobbing and... Uh, lobbing and you know, like, chuck and duck. Yeah. I'm as good at lobbing as Cheech is when he plays tennis, right? He's a lobber. Dude, I could destroy That's one I would it. like to see. Cheech v. Lance in a tennis match. Tennis match. <laughs> tennis match. Oh, if, if I think Lance is a destroyed. tennis ninja. Yeah. So Lance is a state champion tennis player, and I've li- literally never played. That's a, that's a great challenge. We still have to do our around-the-world basketball, yeah. too. That's going to be fun. I will destroy you. <laughs> yeah, big dog. I am He's going to be winded silk. by the second shot. Okay, fly tying. <laughs> okay. So, as you guys know, if you've been following the channel, we, we create flies quite a bit. Um, and uh, we tie existing flies. But I think one of the strengths that we have is we, we create fly patterns. And so, we just kind of wanted to go through uh, some of the topics that we've had here on on uh, creating and designing. Is that what you said? Designing? Yeah, and, designing. Yeah, fly. So, um, yeah, so buckle up. This is going to be a good one. Right? It will be. And it will be controversial. I'm it sure we'll get be, some yeah. negative naysayers on there. But 
Speaking of the negative naysayers, the first thing that I hear when you when you talk about creative fly tying is everything's already been done. Oh yeah, because it has. There's no invention left. There's it's done. There's no room for creativity. So what it, what do we think about that? Boo hiss. Boo hiss. Yeah, but well, there has been a lot that's been done, right? I mean, there's no doubt about that. But there's still tweaks and variables, and there's new materials, new hooks, new threads, new everything coming at all times. So you can't tell me that. Everything that's brand new is, that's just coming out now has already been done because right. half of it wasn't available until six well, months ago. Well, and I ago. think you get the people. I mean, I mean, I, I guess disclaimer: fly tying is is an art in a way. It's functional, but everybody's going to have their their thing. So don't don't take a dump just because people like to come up with something new. <laughs> well, actually, don't dump it, on my yeah, stuff. Yeah, there you go. Better play on words there, but e- either one of them works. I mean, it's all about having fun. If it was just about catching fish, we'd probably just use one fly all the time. And I mean, again, a chimera, a chimera. That's all it would. I mean, because that was because truly an you would be fishing bluegill. Yeah, and they eat anything. Well, I mean, at a high level, though, it's all stuff tied on a hook. Right. Yeah, yeah and the, the one thing I was having a conversation today with somebody about. Um, originality and tools and materials it's like the majority of the stuff that we use for tying flies was actually intended for something else like yeah. chenille like they're basically pipe cleaners and then we realize hey they make cool flies or yeah, yeah. you know so we're we're benefiting from the craft market and and luckily we have so much stuff now to to tie flies with um, that it's absolutely possible to be creative Unless there was like mop flies and dragon tail flies in the fifties, don't think so. Right? Nope. Exactly. So my my comment is: there any creation of fly tying? Yes, with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, <laughs> ten S's. So imagine a snake Luckily saying that yes. That wasn't over twenty. <laughs> <laughs> it was over twenty. Okay, and we we kind of and so just. Just get that in your head. There yeah. is still opportunity for creativity. And I think I would I would argue what you said that it is. I think it is all about t- catching fish. You yeah. Say, you say it's not all about catching fish, but it is within with parameters, right? Yeah. I mean, if it was all about catching fish, well, then we'd all go get nets and get at the top of the river and the bottom of the river yeah. and walk together, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, Dang, that's a way better idea than just fishing. I've hot seen dogs. people do that before. Yeah. Uh, I may or may not have called the uh, the Division of Wildlife oh, and I saw somebody doing that. I was going to uh, say it's probably in Europe somewhere. No, somewhere. it was here. It was wow. here. Uh, yeah, I have seen that before and some people got in trouble, but that's we digress. So, but I think that it is about catching fish. I mean, you're yeah. you're not and you know this. I'm not arguing with you. I'm just making a point, but that you, when you design a new fly, it's with a purpose. It's yeah. to make. There's already a fly, there's already a damsel fly available. Yeah. But you're gonna create a belly flop damsel to fill a niche that's not there. That's that. Yeah. You know, you're gonna improve on it on the existing pattern somehow. You're gonna use a different hook. You're gonna make it weighted. You're gonna make it float. You're gonna make it neutral. You're gonna you know whatever. Yeah. New dubbing color. New marabou. Whatever. There's always a reason to it, and that reason yeah. is, we're trying to catch fish. I, I, I mean. I think it's funny. I have a kind of inside joke with some of my fishing friends, and I know you guys would agree. It, it's it's funny when people say it's just nice to get out. It <laughs> well, is. It is just nice joke. to get out. It's <laughs> nice to be in nature. Yeah, and I it like is. It. <laughs> but it's you're. Let's not kid ourselves. Like if you were just going to get out, you'd just go for a drive or go for a hike. You're yeah. fishing for a purpose. Yeah. If, if you're fishing, you're trying to catch a fish. That's why they call it fishing. Yeah, you're not spending time at the vice just to look at your pretty flies, and you're not studying how fish eat just so that you can know that. Yeah, you know, right, for sure. You want to catch fish. All right, so creation is still out there. So once you have created, I'm doing air quotes for you uh, <laughs> yeah. podcast yeah. listeners. Once you've created a new fly, what is it that makes it a new fly? Um, there was a debate earlier this week about a woolly bugger because there's a fly called a thin mint, right? So a thin mint is a woolly bugger that has three colors of marabou in the tail, a peacock body, a hackle, and a tungsten bead. Yeah. So it's basically a woolly bugger, but I, I think, in my opinion, it's easier to say thin mint instead of triple colored tail, <laughs> yeah. peacock body, yeah. brown hackled You gotta woolly call bugger. it something. Yeah. Right. And so, 
the other thing that I, I was thinking about is why why do we not call a parachute atoms or, or a parachute blue winged olive uh, an olive parachute atoms? Right. Right. Is yeah. That the, I, I mean, I think that the <clears throat> in a way, if you're, I mean, naming flies is is kind of a fun thing for us too, in a way, because uh, well, it's a necessity sometimes because yeah. we have to. We differentiate. Yeah, we have to show people the video or whatever. Yeah. Right, and it's not like anybody is claiming to invent. I mean, we'll troll people a lot by naming a a, a very similar fly something because we know people are can be sometimes sensitive to that. But it does help name the variation of that. And, and when we do it on our videos, we typically put variation of blah blah blah. Yeah. Especially if it's somebody in particular that has uh, that you want to give credit to, like woolly buggers been around for years uh, and certainly we'll say woolly bugger or variation of um, I, I think people get too caught up in oh my gosh he just changed the color and he created a new name blasphemy yeah well the, so you're just giving it a new name so you can identify it it's not I don't, yeah and it, at the end of the day who cares right, right it's not yeah, like exactly. you're gonna make a ton of money off of this fly you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna make millions off of this fly, and it's you know one material different from you, and I I've fallen into that a lot over the years. You know, I used to call people out if I thought their fly was too close to mine, but it's like who cares anymore? I think it's one thing if you're just putting a fly up on YouTube and saying, "Here's my woolly bugger variation with three yeah. ta color tail, tri tri color tail, and peacock." You know, that's one thing. If you're sending it to Umpqua, Fulling Mill, Montana Fly, Rainies, you know, on and on. That's maybe a little different because then it needs to be somewhat, you know, different. Yeah. You've got to change some materials. you got to do something. But, yeah. but it, you know, just putting it up on, if it's for us, for instance, we do a lot of our YouTube videos that are flies that are not commercially available, but they are flies that we're using currently. There are hot new flies or there's some new cool technique that we just want to share with people. Yeah, for sure. So we still got to call it something. Yeah. In that case, we usually, in most of our videos, go out of our way to say, look, this isn't a unique pattern. This is a woolly bugger with three-color tail, you know, yeah. that sort of a thing. They're telling us we need to turn Lance up a little bit. He needs bit. to get closer. Oh. I got to There he goes. Get just, really close. Just move yeah. that closer to your yapper. There, There is one comment, yeah. and I, I will read this word for word because it's gold. Uh, medieval cauliflower says, I do declare <laughs> that you shall not use pipe cleaners as chenille or you shall be struck down and burned. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I love mop, those. The mop. <laughs> feel, feel, free, feel free to send those in because I will read them. In, All right. <laughs> in that Anything voice. I in do the, declare is going to get that I voice. I do declare. <laughs> yeah, but keep it uh, PG-12. Like one step under PG. Because I can't bleep these ones. This is live, folks. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> so, let's see. So we're talking about naming flies. Does every fly you need you create need a name? Not necessarily, right? No. Only you're, if you're going to share it with people. Well, you or yeah, have something to differentiate it from others. Hey, what are you using today? Yeah, Lance, because we always ask him when he comes back from fishing, because we got to know. Yeah, like the leech we just posted. In fact, check out our channel for the diamond jig leech. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, except for I tie it a little differently from these two, and I've been beating them both up over it, even though Lance and I haven't <laughs> fished together with it. Oh, yeah. Well, right. you've been beating me up in your mind, I'm sure. That's how I do it. And on video. That's how I do it. Yeah, I, I make comments about you all the time when you're not there. Yeah, I know that. <laughs> your wife tells me. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I need to have her stop calling the Chuck E. Cheese on the off hours. Uh, <laughs> okay. Go on. Okay, Lance, I think this one, um, your flies are, in my opinion, like the ultimate functional flies. You know, Curtis and I sometimes add a little bit of fluff to the flies. We want to make them maybe look good to us, but... Mine like don't you, look good. If you look That's at a, yeah, it, you don't. It's getting deep. No, here, if you look at a red dart and someone wants to fish a betas hatch and they say this won't work, um, explain to us kind of when you're designing a fly, working on a fly, um, working on how how functional those flies are versus say appearance, form, or function. Form or function. Well, most of my flies are designed, for, well, I guess, yeah, most of them I would qualify as designed for a particular purpose to 
um, float really well, to get down really well, to you know, to imitate something. Maybe not so much in my flies uh, occasionally, but you know, uh, Iron Lotus would be a good example. The Iron Lotus is basically a Betis nymph that I've added a little hot spot to, right? I, the betas that I sample on our local waters tend to be pretty dark. They tend to have lighter colored segments. So yep. they're, therefore the, the white segments on the, uh, over the olive thread. Uh, the red, obviously a betas nymph has none of that. So I put the red in there to um, give a little hot spot. So mine are definitely more function over form. And I, I tend to go through lots of variations of my flies. I, I create a fly in my head, you know, I tie it at the bench. I go and fish it. If it works really well, well, then it might be done. Most of the time, though, it takes several, you know, s tying sessions, several iterations of, of trying to tweak materials, tweak hooks, and on and on. And some of that goes on for years. I still, I'm still playing with like dry flies. You guys know this when we're float fishing all summer. Uh, I'm always playing with different hooks with my with my flies, and yep. each and there isn't one hook that's perfect for every situation. Some of them. When I'm fishing a hopper or an ant, I want a little heavier wire hook. And anyway, I, we go on and on about this, but the, the, I think the bottom line is there's just a process to creating a fly that, for me, re involves the fish. Involves uh, there, are, there are lots of flies out there that uh, are really cool in the fly fishing world. We call them, they have bin appeal, right? They look really yeah. neat in the bins, and mine probably don't qualify for that most of the time. Most of my flies are pretty simple, pretty rough. Um, but I hope that the the people that try them uh, that they catch fish on them. That's that's how my that's how I envision my flies. I, I like to have my flies work so well and hopefully be relatively durable, so people will want to buy more of them or want to tie more of them. Them there flies only catch fishermen. <laughs> These here in my box that's that have right. been in here for forty years. Them the ones that catch fish. Well, as we know, you could catch a fish some places on just about any fly, but there are definitely some flies that are more prone to catch fishermen than fish. You know, and, and uh, I think that all three of us, we, we have flies in catalogs, and we've, we've gone through the process, and there, you know, there are a few flies that just kind of stand out as far as a design that, you know, something that we've worked on. Um, Glance, you are telling us about the process for the Rainbow Warrior. Um, Tell us about how, how that came about. That one was not a uh, process, really. That one was... <laughs> so that's good. Sat down. Yeah, that was, that was one of, that's one of the different ones for me. That was my first commercially available fly. And uh, really, it was, it was commercially available by accident because I didn't, I didn't set out to have it that way. Uh, I just tied those flies. I don't really even... I did it long enough ago. I don't really remember why or how. Uh, I mean, obviously, I know how, but I don't know, I don't know what my, my motivation was. I tied them. Uh, I think I had four of them in the box, and I don't know, even know how long I had them in my box. Probably six, eight months. Never fished them, and one day on the river, I was catching a few fish, but not nearly as many as I thought that I should. I was yeah. seeing the water was low. I was seeing fish, so I could see the activity level of the fish, um, and I could tell they were. I, I'm watching fish that are eating nymphs, you know. So I'm I'm catching them at a rate that I didn't think was okay. So I just started changing flies. I went through all my regular patterns and was catching a fish here and there, and they weren't cutting it. So then I start going into my what I call try me flies, right? So I get out the Rainbow Warrior, tie it on, and go from like an eight fish day to like a forty fish day <laughs> in in just a couple hours. Yeah. I, I know how that's you count. No, that's and nothing for you. I know, NBD. But. Yeah. <laughs> so then I was at the time working at Fish Tech uh, up in Salt Lake. And uh, so I went into the shop and told Mickey at the time, hey, I got this fly. When you know, Mickey's, Mickey's been in the fly fishing industry like as long as I've been alive, right? So I'm sure his, in his mind, <laughs> he didn't give me this, but in his mind, I can only imagine like, Mickey's oh, yeah, eyes yeah. are glazing over going, oh yeah, I got another guy with a hot fly, cool. <laughs> but I said, Mickey, you got, t trust me, this fly was wrecking them. He kind of gave me the, well, that's cool. That's really good. You know, uh, I like that. Maybe you could tie a few and we'll put them in the bins and sell them and we'll see how the customers like them. And I, yeah, that sounds great. So I think I tied a dozen or two, put them in the bins and we sold them and the customers that bought them caught lots of fish and came back asking for more. And, uh, that first winter is when I, it was kind of in a fall day when I first came up with that, that first winter, I think I tied 133 dozen of them for the shop because um, we couldn't keep them in oh, stock. Man. And then the when the rep came around, the rep at the time was Van Rollo, Van came around for Umpqua, and uh, he said, 
He said, you guys, you know, let's get your preseason going. And, and uh, Mickey said, hey, you guys do uh, custom flies, right? And that van said, yeah, yeah, you got to do like 10 dozen or something. You know, at the time it's <laughs> yeah. changed now. But at the time more. it was like, you got to do like 10 dozen, to, you know, trying to deter you from just yeah. doing nonsense. And Mickey's like, oh, I think we'd, we could come up with that. So we show him this little fly and he's, he kind of gives us the look like, oh, yeah, that one. Oh, cool. <laughs> Flashy little guy. All right, cool. He said, well. Do you think you'd want to do those custom? And we're like, yeah, yeah. He goes, do you think you could go through 10 dozen next year? Well, yeah, considering we went through 130 dozen in the last <laughs> couple of months, we probably could. And he said 133 dozen. How, that's quick know. math right there. Yeah, he said, he said that's nuts. Uh, you know, maybe we should consider just putting it in the catalog. And I, I never even didn't even occur yeah, to me. Yeah. So then he kind of, he, he had me tie samples <laughs> and they sent them to Umqua. And, and the next year they were in the catalog and then the rest is history. That was my first commercially available fly. And the next year I sent them like 24 patterns and got zero of them accepted. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about the rejection we when will. you send flies in a little bit. Curtis, what's the fly that stands out for you? Um, so I, I think probably the first one that it really entered my mind about mm -hmm. doing, uh, or at least ended up getting I accepted into time. a catalog. This Cheech interrupts my stream. How rude. Thought. Sorry. Uh, was the Fripple, and that one was, I was fishing a pretty pressured stretch of the Provo, and uh, it was slow, clear water, and I was kind of throwing my normal comparadons or parachute style patterns and just getting refusal after refusal, and I realized the fish were eating, um, or at least I thought, because I, I see these full you know mature nice looking upright wing mayflies floating right by and they weren't getting eaten mm. as often and so i said i think they're they're either feeding on emergers or mm. maybe cripples that hadn't fully formed and so i ended up taking a um i think it was a maybe a no hackle mm. and just beating it up oh, it doesn't take much with the no hackle to beat it up mm -hmm. um but it wouldn't float very well, but I was still getting hits on that. Mm -hmm. So I went home, I messed around with different wing materials, finally came up with, at the time it was style cut medallion sheeting. Yep. That stuff was awesome Yeah, I, too. I mean, to this day, I still have a fair bit stashed away. They don't make it anymore, and nobody else makes the same stuff. And if anyone can dial that in, yeah. let and us go know. For it. Let us know, we'll sell it's that. different than the I current medallion sheeting. Oh, yeah, it's, oh, yeah. it's quite a bit different. <clears throat> uh, it still works, but... Mm -hmm. This stuff crinkled better, it singed the edges better. So I went back to the same stretch with uh, those tied in. It was just wings flat, and we weren't upright at all. And it floated surprisingly well for not having hackle or hair of any sort, um, mostly because of surface area. And it, it did really well. And then I would keep fishing different hatches, matching the colors, and it was just phenomenal. So that one was one where I had just and again, I hadn't seen anything like that. Mm -hmm. It was a necessity, and you know, what is it? Uh, ne necessity is the mother of invention. Something like something that. like that. Yeah. yeah he he reads motivational yeah. books and stuff. I have and posters. <laughs> I, have posters. <laughs> I still do Disney movies. <laughs> so, you know, here's a question: We know why Lance's is called the Rainbow Warrior, but why is yours called the Fripple? I thought that was for fur, yeah. furry nipple, right? Furry nipple. <laughs> Do not Google that. No, I'm just joking. Ooh, I thought that's work. what you used to tie it with. No, yeah. <laughs> Cheech inspired me. <laughs> I was changing um, one day, so <laughs> and I didn't see the camera. <laughs> oh, man. Been waxing ever detour, since. Detour, detour. <laughs> oh. Okay. Curt <laughs> Curtis's like, last name is Fry. Fry. <laughs> and a, it was a cripple Oh, pattern. that's it? And All so this time. <laughs> I just came up with, I just combined the two. I just uh, put it as a cripple, cripple. and fripple. So you think you I go. got a hairy back? Fries, fries, Watch fripple. me turn around. Oh, my gosh. All right, I'll, I'll, talk, I'll talk real quick about the, uh, the baby fat minnow. I was going to talk about the grumpy frumpy, but I've talked about that before, but... The baby fat minnow was just kind of an accident. It was a low fat minnow. And when we, we create a fly and we do a video on it, it doesn't mean that we stop the creation process on that fly. And so 
the baby fat minnow was just a, a really dumbed down version of the of the low fat minnow you know after fishing the low fat minnow for several years it got to the point where i said you know i could probably get the same effectiveness out of fewer materials and pare this down a little bit and that also happened right around the time that fulling mill came out with that bonio carp hook which is absolutely phenomenal so uh, out fishing one day and just kind of threw it on there. I was with Brigham from the shop, you know, and so if he can catch fish on it, then we have a really good, <laughs> that was the, that's the uh, litmus test. Yeah. That's the, every podcast we got to take a jab at Brigham because he was making fun of me on social media yesterday. <laughs> but you know, that, that fly had a few tweaks, you know, I, there, there's a tungsten bead in it there. There's a little bit less bulk to it, but uh, and who knows? Maybe down the road it will it will be different from from how it is now. I think the original had a flashy tail, and then we got those spay chickaboo pelts from Whiting that had really fine marabou type feathers, and you know that was that. So and that was kind of lucky because that was a fairly quick process with the low or yeah. with the baby fat minnow. Sometimes you luck out and you tie it up and go fish it, and and they just work. So anyway fly creation so we talked a little bit about submitting the flies to the catalogs and i'll start out with this um not all your flies need to be in a catalog to be legit right and when we say catalog we, we're talking about the fly manufacturers and and the process is you you send them flies they all have their own different process they go through the flies and if they select one of your flies they tie those flies commercially at their factories yeah. and sell those to shops all across the nation or world, like the Chimera. They have their machines do it, right? <laughs> yeah. No, these these hairs hand-tied. Yeah, Me and our... Mama stayed up all night to tie <laughs> these suckers. You came call, out of the basement just for that. We call them rainbow lotuses. <laughs> anyway, so you, you, you send it out if they, if they accept your flies. Now you're a fly designer for them. Um, and you make a royalty on every single fly sold from them. So that's kind of a cool deal. Um, and people get rich doing that. Totally rich. So let's talk about that for a sec. Okay. <laughs> so um, the royalties are are pretty small. I mean, they're they're a small percentage of each fly. Uh, the good thing is you get paid, f- you know, in perpetuity. That's a big word for me. Ooh. I was. That You're means, from Vernal. That's pretty impressive. I know. I learned it in Lehigh yesterday. <laughs> anyway, uh, but you important. you get paid for basically ever for not doing anything if you have a hot fly. So that's cool. The downside is it's probably not going to be a ton of money <laughs> unless yeah. you unless it's the Rainbow Warrior. Even that's Even, not a ton of money. <laughs> I mean, <clears throat> I guess from a couple different standpoints, I, I, I think some people maybe have the impression that you're making money hand over fist when you submit flies which is certainly not the case you I are mean, compared to somebody in a third world country uh, yeah that's a good point but yeah. uh, for u.s standards yeah no it, it's not going to make a livelihood for you no um which is fine i mean i don't think i at least personally didn't go into it thinking that and i don't think any of us did uh i mean at a certainly we get this question a lot is you know how do i go how do I do that? Say, mm-hmm. I want to get my flies in Umpqua. I want to get them in Fulling Mill. Or I want to get them in wherever. Um, every company's going to have a different process, and, uh, th- and it's not an easy process. It requires a lot of work. You have to tie samples, provide instructions, do write-ups. Yeah. Uh, so it's not just send them a photo and you're in. You're right. Um, so I guess the other reason would be, you know, it, it may be a sense of accomplishment. <clears throat> that at least for sure. me was kind of hey, it's a validation. I did this fly it's you know it kind of made made the ultimate pinnacle as a fly or whatever um but at the end of the day uh, it it is kind of cool to see them in a catalog like that um other considerations i think fly companies would use just to answer people's questions that we've seen come up before is um you know once the process is because you can submit you'll find if you contact the company so give you a process if they're accepting submit flies. Submit at will. Yeah, and you and you submit them. And guess what? I mean, we've, at least I, have been rejected many, many times over mm-hmm. with a couple different fly companies, uh, as has Lance, as has Cheech, as has everybody that I think has done this. So it's certainly not a guaranteed thing when you have what you think is the most awesome pattern. Mm-hmm. 
And even once they're in, there's no guarantee they're going to stay in the catalog. No, yeah, they could get discontinued. It's a business. If yeah, it's here's, not moving. Here's the one that I always hear that's kind of funny. He's like, well, these flies are guaranteed to catch fish. Well, these catch duh. fish. And as we talked about bin appeal, it's like the flies in the bins kind of have to have that in order to yeah. sell. Like the, the people looking through have to see that. Um, they're not always going to be on the, the fancy InstaFace machine that tells them exactly what fly they need all the time. Um, they're just going to kind of pick, okay, this kind of looks like the bugs that I'm trying to match. So they'll pick it out. So if your flies don't have that, then it might not go in the catalog, regardless of how many fish it catches. Yeah. But, so if yeah. you do submit and you get rejected, don't take it personally. Right. We've, we've had, I've seen a couple people really go off on a company mm. for not taking their flies. And, you yeah. know, don't take it personally. It's, it, you're also submitting with a lot of other people. Um, yeah, like a thousand. Yeah, lots. Mm -hmm. So it, it's not a small number. You may think, okay, well, I've got this great fly. It works. I caught fish with it, and it, it's great. And, and and it might be. Mm -hmm. it absolutely could slay fish. But uh, So it's a, it's, it's a process. Um, try again. Yeah. yeah. I think I, I know from talking to friends at Umpqua, at least, that there's more to it than just the fly. You could have a fly that absolutely slays fish, but if there's nothing else, if it doesn't have – it's legs on the ground already at least you know nobody knows about it or you don't have a book or a video or a, a magazine article or any yeah. way to promote it it doesn't really matter how great the fly is if it can't get off the ground and it nobody ever orders any or you know three shops in the country yeah. try them and then they buy a dozen or two and they never order it again it that doesn't do umqua's invested a bunch of time and effort or fully mill or whoever whichever company that, that doesn't work. So that there needs to be a little bit behind it as, as well. Yeah. Especially today. I mean, For sure. I don't think unless you've already gotten an in with a company and you've got a proven track record, it would be very unlikely for you to submit and be accepted without some of that history or that yeah. track record. If you're working for a shop where you can say, look, if you guys will do this, the, our shop will buy X number already, right. you know, yeah. and that might meet their minimum, then perfect. Then they can build from there. But if you're, if you're just, you have your work cut out for you, if you're, you know, geek off the street part, you know, n no offense, but if, if you're not in the industry and you, you don't have a way to promote it, I can't tell you, you're not going to get accepted, but it, that's an uphill battle for yeah, sure. It, absolutely. You know, the other thing that I hear is, you know, everybody that I've, I've, had look at my fly loves it i've sent it out to some people and they absolutely love it well guess what when you send free stuff to people they have the tendency to say <laughs> that they like it so they get more um so uh, when i was starting to come up with some flies i i would send it to people that i knew would be honest with me like they don't have a dog in the fight they're going to tell me if it sucks they're going to tell me if it sinks they're going to tell me if it falls apart and then you can make those changes before you you send it into a company so and that's the other thing is once you're in typically the companies will kind of follow what you're doing and they will ask you for for your flies yeah. like like lance with the rainbow warrior that was kind of they they kind of worked it out that way right yeah so not what, not initially because it didn't that one didn't take off right we sold tons of <clears> in the <throat> shop i worked for but only a few other shops tried them but over the years as other shops did try them it, it grew legs and started to sell quite a bit yeah so we're lucky that we have the rainbow warrior in today's day and age are we i don't know if we're about that but <laughs> it's awesome it sells it yeah. does sell and it, it catches fish it most sells. importantly well we don't care if it catches fish we're just in it for the money right <laughs> the Benjamins. oh geez yep all right so submitting flies check okay now we're going to get into this part and we we hear this or um, everybody has a voice now because of social media and everybody posts flies on instagram facebook or wherever they do youtube videos and so everybody can comment on how complicated your fly is versus how simple it could be to catch fish so the other debate that i i see in the fly design arena is simple flies versus complicated flies and so we talked about this a little bit in in the functionality versus the form um what what else can we add to that that we haven't talked about already well i think uh my bar merger <laughs> Jeez, yeah <laughs> talk about that okay let me describe it before he talks about it imagine 
a turd. A m- miniature olive-sized turd <laughs> threaded on a But it's hook. on a hook. On a hook. By well, turd, do you mean stonefly? Because some people call like a patch rubber like no, a turd. No, like a piece of poop. Okay, thank you. <laughs> no, just just yeah. wanted to make sure. <laughs> <laughs> I just did that for dramatic effect. All right, Curtis, now go ahead and explain. <laughs> I Even today, my one of my favorite patterns is Barr Merger, mm-hmm. John Barr, um, who we met earlier this year for the first time great fly designer he's a good dude yeah yeah um awesome and so when i was in college i worked at a fly shop and i would trade my crappily tight well they probably weren't super crappy but it's not up to the level of a bar merger because i would take bin flies in exchange because i didn't like tying them because they were so freaking they took too they had long. a tail and a wing case a tail and which wing is case and legs little, yeah Don't forget it's the too legs. much she uh, says the guy who ties like ripples no i know i know it's a contradiction i'm full of those <laughs> all right it's fun but, though. uh yeah so uh one of my favorite mayfly patterns nymphs and so it, with the bead head i was finally convinced i needed to tie my own and i realized at first that i didn't need a tail then i realized the wing case didn't make a huge difference if i had a different color dubbing for the thorax and then i took the legs out and so I was just basically fish. I still called it a bar as a merger, a bead head. <laughs> yeah. Because that was like my go-to pattern. And we're fishing somewhere. I don't even remember. And I, Cheech asked me what I was using. I told him. And he, he looks at it and he's like, what the? You said a bar merger. This is not even close. Well, so, I had legit, like, nice yeah. <laughs> bars emergers I was tying on. I wasn't catching as many fish. So I guess the point is. Um, fish a blame, green turd? You, you blame can, the fly. Yeah, you can fish. Like. But I'll sit down and I'll tie fancier flies or more complex flies because I enjoy the process. Yeah. And I'll fish them too. But at the same time, if it's the night before a trip, I'll forget the freaking wings and legs and not on just on bar mergers, but a lot of things. You, I guess you could call them like guide flies mm-hmm. where you, you just want to pound a bunch out. Um, and, and there's certainly times where a wing case may make a difference. Um, yeah. So I'm not saying those things aren't good. I'm, I'm just saying so when it comes to flies – Simplicity is good, but it's not. I get know, that way before guide be trips where I'm trying to just bust out yeah. as many as possible. And the crazy thing then is in my mind, I'm I'm trimming down the steps to make them easier to tie. But then when we catch lots of fish on them, that becomes now the confidence right. way to build them. Yeah. <laughs> That's the benchmark. So then you're like, well, forget all that other nonsense. <laughs> Let's just make these as simple as possible because they catch more fish, even though it probably doesn't really make a difference. It's just I'm more confident in that new version. Yeah, a- yeah. absolutely. I, I think that, uh, you know, for me, the, the the example I'll use is like the project hopper. You know, that's something I've been playing with for a long, long time. There are circumstances where I need that realism for the fish to eat it. And we've seen that where they'll reject a normal hopper. But if I know that I'm going to go to a place where the fish are just absolutely murdering hoppers, oh, yeah. I'll tie the slum hopper, you know, which is basically a chunk of foam, some legs, and you just slap it all together. Um, and it's going to fish just the same. So, but the process of being able to dial in that the project hopper, I think makes me fish the more simple hoppers more confidently because I know that if I'm getting noses up or I'm getting turn or rejections on the, on the other hoppers that I have something in my box that that probably is going to do the trick. Yeah, no doubt. Um, the other thing is, um, you should challenge yourself. (laughs) to to get better at fly tying you know it's not going to take you any extra time to to have better skill at say tying off a parachute or wrapping a tighter dub body Um, if you get better at that stuff and your flies are cleaner um, it's not going to take you any longer to tie a clean fly than it is a a crappy fly or a complicated fly if you dial down those techniques absolutely i can i mean that's one thing i when i get into a mode at least for me when I'm designing a fly or, or tying one that I've done, is lining a bunch of stuff up to tie a bunch of them. Don't just do one or two, because yeah. if you w- really want to get good, uh, I think volume would lead to better design and creativity. If you can tie a bunch of them, then you become faster. You can do that a little easier. Mm-hmm. Um, at least if I were to tie a bunch of bars and mergers today, I'd probably make them fancier. I would make but you I'd do be, that. I'd be much more efficient at it. <laughs> the other thing is every Every about two years, I get a wild hair, and I'm like, okay, I'm going to dial in married wings. I'm going to tie a bunch of classic 
downwing wet flies and they're going to be awesome and then i just destroy a bunch of wings and just <laughs> end up throwing like scissors across the room but when i go back to tying my normal stuff every thread wrap counts a little bit better and i've challenged myself i, I do that with uh, classic wet flies or deer hair you know sometimes yeah. you got to take yourself out of your comfort zone yes there you go si, lance senor. lance agrees and he speaks <laughs> espanol no i think that's a good point though because I, I like i would argue i don't do that as much as i should i tend to <clears throat> tie almost always just for fishing purposes and i i can see both of you but i think cheech maybe more even than curtis uh does just tackles some you know, today I'm going to do sliders. I'm going to I'm going to work on my deer hair work, or I'm going to do this, and maybe you do that more than I know. But I think Cheech does that more than anybody I know, which makes it so that he ties really clean flies in, kind of regardless of whether they're streamers, dries, nymphs, whatever. They're always really clean. It's Her, called ADD. ADD. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we all have a little bit of that in our flies. We all want them to look clean, but. Uh, but that's, I think that's a good thing to do. It pushes people out of their normal comfort zones. I, I would argue I got, I'm not the as good of a tire as either of you guys, but I got, <laughs> I got as, it's I got. getting deep here, boys. No, Let I'm, me put my hippers on. No, I think people see that in the videos. You guys tie really <laughs> clean flies. So, but I got uh, pretty good at tying flies when I tied commercially for work. I, you, like you're talking earlier, the old joke was if you tie a dozen, <laughs> then the you know after number 12 you probably look back at the first three and throw them away and start over right yeah um not necessarily the case when you get a little more uh, dialed in on tying but certainly your first attempt at anything is not going to be as good as your 12th and sometimes when you're commercially tying i would do 30 or 40 dozen of the same fly the same size and by the time you're 10 dozen in you want to kill yourself after 40 dozen you don't ever want to tie that fly again but it makes you tie it made me tie flies that i would never have done yeah. and then when i worked at fish tech when i was pretty young they would have me do all of their uh, custom orders so i would have uh i would tie flies that for other people that i would never tie for myself it wasn't on i was doing it on company time on company materials so i would just go to the rack that you know customer bring in a fly that i thought looked really thought looked really stupid but they want a dozen of them and so that was my job for the day right so I go pick out the materials, get the hooks as close as possible, and tie flies that I'd never tied before, and I had to try and make them, uh, you know, fly bin quality. Right Either out of the that gates. or they looked like their grandpa's mashed up fly. That well, that depended on the fly. I would get some. That's a good point. I would get some that the customer would bring it in and say, can you match this? And I'd go, well, I can tie something like that, but I don't think I can make it look quite that bad. <laughs> just tie left-handed. And they'd say, look that bad. I just killed him on that fly yesterday. Well, I can tell. Did you, you have any others you didn't fish? Because this one doesn't have anything left on it. But <laughs> no, you get good at uh, when, you put, when you take yourself out of your comfort zone uh, and you do something you tie patterns or styles that you're not used to that that improves your tying so if all you ever do is tie beadhead nymphs well you're going to be really good at those but when somebody says tie me a dozen you know parachute atoms you're going to probably yeah, struggle sure. somebody says tie me a deer hair popper you're going to really struggle but if you learn how to do all those things pretty soon you look at any fly and you can go i can make that you know within reason i could do a pretty good job at that it's all about attitude to to just like fishing you know with tying you should always be in learning mode you should always um not be too prideful to realize maybe your way isn't the best way to, to nobody do something. knows it all whether <clears throat> fishing or tying nobody yeah. knows it all yeah that's that's true well, i know somebody who does anyway hey somebody's asking hey is Other that there lance egan yes that is lance egan right there that? steve and medieval cauliflower this is awesome because uh the other day somebody asked lance to explain to them that story <laughs> right i have no idea what you're talking about yeah he did <laughs> he told me that that's awesome so we're gonna keep that ball rolling that's our tradition on the podcast it is too a tradition. okay whoa i my voice squeaked in the other video the other day too <laughs> by the way i wore the same shirt in the podcast today because somebody mentioned that it looked like i lost weight <laughs> Dang, that's not the case. I don't know. I don't know what shirt I wore last week. Uh, it was a Team USA. It was. Yeah. I just know because I edit it. And I have to look at the you footage do have to like look at it for a long times. time. Yeah. yeah, that's good. I was we, a little worried that I wore this one last week too, and then I thought somebody will make fun of me, and I'll just say, "Look, don't make fun of my Wednesday outfit." I almost put the same shirt on. Yeah, and I didn't because I remember. Well, I did it on purpose. Well, there so you go. You Who cares? All can go to. Hey, any thinning shirt is a good thing. 
Yes. <laughs> I agree. I still have thinning, to find that kind thinning of Thinning hair, not such a good thing. Thinning <laughs> shirts, good. Don't know what you're talking about. I have this uh, silver fox effect. If, for those of you who aren't watching on silver. YouTube, imagine... Silver fox or... flowing Grizzly locks. bear. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're not talking about the hairy nipples anymore. Oh, so. uh, Gosh, Which man. one? The third one? <laughs> Jeez. Okay, speaking of hairy stuff, we're going to talk about streamers a little bit. Hey-o. hey That is called a segue, not Seg- just something that you ride on. Bazinga. <laughs> okay, so um, talking about using materials, um, there are lots of cool, cool materials out there. We interrupt this uh, message to, or a message to Dr. Pepper. If you would like to send us some cases of any Dr. Pepper regular diet, we especially love the 10. The 10. We, we, do, we do accept cases of Dr. Pepper. We need sponsors from Surface, Microsoft Surface, Dang. so that Lance can have a machine. I'll just bring um, in my MacBook. Surface. I said, <laughs> I said machine, not decoration. Oh, my goodness. All right, we Listen need some good coasters. <laughs> Says the guy right. with an iPhone. I know. Well... Okay, go on. Anyway, we're, we're talking about fly streamers. So I know, that's why I interrupted streamers. So, uh, <laughs> oh, people that get on streamers get on this high horse. I know. It is a high horse yeah, because they're is. throwing literally everything and the horse on those flies. Um, so <laughs> Maybe too much? Yeah. So Curtis and I have the S-O-A-H uh, principle. It's uh, stuff. stuff on a hook. PG-12. <laughs> where people are using like 47 different materials on a size 1 Gamakatsu B10S. They eat up the whole hook gap and then they show like this. It's this awesome and material. And it floats. And it floats. <laughs> yeah. That's another good point. So guess what? If you streamer. use a yard of EP fibers, your fly will float. Yeah. If you're tying EP minnows. For a minute. Most of them that look really cool out of the water are going to float on their side yeah. like that. Anyway, it's a cool fly, but don't overdo it with materials. Like, get those out and fish them. Um, I had to scrap uh, when I was first tying the lunch lady pattern. If you yeah. want to see a cool articulated fly, it's kind of the predecessor of the Flugen zombie. But I, I, the dubbing on the head, I was just trying to throw too much crap in there, and it would not ride right. The fish wouldn't eat it. And so we had to go back to, and when I say we, I had to go back to the drawing board with that one because I had too much S-O-A-H. Bingo. I would agree. So use that hashtag to call (laughs) people out, right? Yeah, that'll work. Yeah. That will create harmony. I created that. My name is Lance Egan. (laughs) No. That's going to be transcribed on the internet forever. Okay. We'll see how that works out for you. (laughs) Anyway, what what are some other things about usage of materials? Too much, too little, anything else we can add there? Um, one thing I would say is, the, at least for me, the materials should drive the function. Like, uh, for instance, with my Fripple example, the material I needed had to have the function to float the fly but look legitimately like some wings. Mm-hmm. So. Um, and you found that on your abdomen. Yes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> he brushes his belly hair with Velcro. Take the lint for the thorax. <laughs> this is such a disturbing episode. <laughs> Don't take notes on this one. <laughs> if you have mental images in your head, just wash that well, palette Cut it clean. out. That Jeez. is yeah. brutal. Exactly. All right. Sorry. But no, yeah. Um, you know, the material should drive the function, or the ma- function should drive the material selection for the most part. Um, and so, uh, where was I going to go with that? Oh, so, I mean, there's, just because it's a, it, it might be a good material looking, I'm, I'm looking at, like, in my case, uh, when I fished Strawberry Reservoir, this is a number of years ago, I wanted to tie up a chub minnow that imitated the chub uh, population in the imitated reservoir. Imitated a chub minnow? <laughs> Oh, Lance made me subconsciously want to cough there. Um, <laughs> so I had a whole batch of EP fibers, and I used, like, I graduated the colors down. Mm-hmm. So I, the backs were kind of greenish gray, and then a different color. I probably used three or four different colors in that thing. I get out on the lake, and I throw them out there, and they, they floated. And even on a sinking line, it took a while for it to get to not float. Sure. And then it wouldn't ride right. So... 
uh, again, if it looks good in the vice and there's you know reason that, that I chose EP fibers, I, it looked good and they would work, but I just used too much of it. So uh, you know, I think the material selection should be driven a lot by by function and what you need the fly to do. Uh, it's also cool to try new new yeah. materials. I mean, On that note, I think generally less is more in you know oh, in yeah. EP yeah. Sure, certainly, but in general uh, streamers anymore, we get so many streamers that you can't even throw for trout unless you're using a rod that's really not made for trout. You know, you yeah. throw them, I don't know. Hold, hold on, I got a Fenwick that's got oh, a come on. Butt, fighting butt on it yeah. that I just grab on there and it yeah, throws I bet you it. do. You probably yeah. have three of them, triple fighting butts. Yep. So the... the One oh, for each nipple. Oh my gosh, here we go. <laughs> so there's, I mean, to me, and I'm, you know, call me crazy, but throwing trout flies with an eight weight even if the fish are all 22 inches, just that, uh, this is me talking. I'm not, this is not, you know, the end all be all just me, but I don't, I don't get crazy about throwing an eight weight for trout. That's just me. Other people do. I, know I did. You did recently. <laughs> recently. Well, we did a strawberry. We wanted to test the and ask you can, with, right? And they we're good. And you but can. Yeah, you're right though. But to me, if you can catch the same fish on a streamer, that's tied to be a little more sparse so you can throw it on a six or five or whatever. Yeah. Uh, to me, that's a better or in use no of, wind. Well, that's a good point on fly yeah. design. Is that's not a functional thing of the fly or what you're going <clears throat> after. That's rod related. Like, are, are you going to tie this ginormous streamer that just can't be thrown with a six weight? Mm-hmm. A lot of people don't understand that when you're talking about rod weights, it, it's not only driven by the fish size. In fact, it's not all driven by a the lot fish of size. It's fly. It's fly mm-hmm. in conditions like yeah. super windy or something. Fighting the fish comes into play. And fighting, but, yeah. yeah but casting the fly, delivering the fly to them is why we're using a fly rod. And like, who was in the shop that was talking about, uh, about somebody was talking about saltwater flies and, and, uh, probably Rob. The amount of flash. Oh. Like people that haven't fished the salt that are designing flies or, or looking <clears> to <throat> tie some flies for a trip. And they've got a lot of flash. I've only fished the salt for a few times, so I'm no expert. But um, again, that's one of those things where what you tie into the fly, there's a lot of factors that go into that. Mm-hmm. You know, what the fish are looking at, your conditions, your rod. I think less is more across the board, though. Sparse dry normally is a good thing. Yeah. You know, maybe take out a chubby Chernobyl or something like that. But even those are relatively thin on the body yeah it's the wings are easily castable for the fly as big of a profile as it is it's pretty pretty thin a good streamer example an articulated fly but the cheech leech i think is well designed it's mostly dubbing and marabou which don't you know absorb a little water but far less than rabbit or uh and many, any number of other materials that it's just still for a big profile it's relatively easy to yeah. throw um, nymphs certainly sink better when they're really thin i think less is more that comes back to your you know don't just don't throw everything you've got on your table on on the hook you don't need that you know somebody brought up a good point soft hackles i mean that's that's one people typically over hackle the soft hackle unless you're going for that collared you know stiff dense yeah. hackle look but yeah you can you can go like half a turn with those and strip one of the sides um i remember back in the day curtis and i were going to a show and there was a guy that was touted to be a, a decent fly tire and you know he probably is now I don't, I don't know but uh we looked at his flies and he was using like just huge amounts of dubbing and really long tails and the right colors it was all the right materials but he had basically a size 12 betas tied on a size 18 we called it the fatty long tail and uncle ken tied it so Anyway, you know, not saying that 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 fly wouldn't work at certain places, but um, no, you know, but like you were saying with a dry fly, even if you if you densely hackle that, sometimes that hackle can impede the fish from actually eating it. Yeah. So what's I mean, if, if when somebody brings, we get this a lot. What somebody brings in flies and they want you to critique them, what is the number one critique, generally speaking? Well, your proportions are off too much material which means your proportions are off yeah. yeah for me it's almost always a dubbed fly yeah. so they'll, they'll bring in their nymphs or their dry flies and say critique this for me and always too much dubbing yeah too much too thick yeah uh, a good rule of thumb with dubbing is take how much dubbing you think you need cut it in half and then cut it in half again yeah start with that much mm-hmm. yeah so true it's a lot easier to put more on than take take it off yeah and it well, sticks to the thread better that way too heck yeah 
yeah so anyway um yeah i think that's that's kind, that's kind of, of it you know yeah, it's that covers uh, the gamut that now you know how to design flies this is one last point i'd like to make is if you're tying flies you don't always have to come up with something completely original that's why our youtube channel exists we want to give people ideas we and tie the exact same thing that we're tying for all uh for all we care um fly tying is is an individual thing like you might do it you know a certain way uh, you know you might just want to follow the recipe we call those recipe guys bless your souls because you keep us in business we love the recipe guys <laughs> mm -hmm. and then we have people who want to freestyle a little bit more but you absolutely don't need to always be creating something new you know you can take stuff out of the book you can um, look at videos and do exactly what they're doing you're still going to catch fish you're still going to have a ton of fun time flies yep. might not get stuff in the catalog but who cares at the yeah. end of the day there's something to be said for following a recipe. If it's a fly that you have a tire, it's, it's from a tire that you have confidence in, the pink dubbing that's Spectra. I know you can, because I do it all the time. And uh, from hens, they, they tag me in, in flies all the time that they say are a knock, you know, not, not a knockoff, but a variation of one of my patterns. And sometimes I go, yeah, that is a variation. Sometimes I go, I don't, I don't see it, but yeah. <laughs> I'm not seeing there's no materials that overlap, but oh well doesn't matter as long as yeah. you're having fun. And at the end of the day, go back to our other podcast where we talked about the rules of fly fishing. Correct. There Ooh, that's a good one. That's where the southern preacher really spread his I wings. I declare. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's all good, man. We're having fun. It's a hobby. We're tying flies. Uh, if you come up with something new, that's cool. Not too serious. Yeah. It's all so about catching a fish. do what makes you happy. Don't bag on others because they don't do it the way you think. Uh, a, lot, a lot of that going on, which is unfortunate, but... You know, have fun with it. Sure. Yeah, this is, yeah, I, I agree. Um, everybody does, you know, fly fishing or fly tying differently. And so um, it's okay. I know this is groundbreaking and shocking, but it's okay if people do things differently from how you do it. Yeah. <laughs> right? No. So anyway, that, that was uh, the whole purpose of the podcast, so we could say that. End of story. All right. Okay. okay. I think we're about done so if you haven't already you need to subscribe right now or else we're just going to make this live video go on forever okay so <laughs> you've got to push subscribe you got to mash the bell so you, you get uh notifications sometimes these podcasts are on late notice and you will get a notification if we do it if you want to buy the most awesome fly tying materials on the whole planet and we will even spray bacon scented spray in your bag if you ask for it. <laughs> Go to store.flyfishfood.com. No, we won't. I, you're, you report to Curtis. I can tell the other guys to do it. Well, I guess right. Cheech is picking from now on. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> I just need to find some bacon flavored spray. It may not be spray. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. He's on keto. Yeah. <laughs> Um, where we have an Instagram page that we uh, we upload stuff to all the time. On Facebook, we have a group called Fly Tying with Uncle Cheech. We like to keep it positive. We like to keep politics out of it, which is a big deal. Um, but anyway, if uh, if you have any questions for us, comments, suggestions, comment below. Uh, hit us up on all the other social media platforms, and uh, Lance will give your fly a free review. Um, for the first five flies that you send him pictures of. Oh, is that true, boss? Famous last words. <laughs> <laughs> we will give you comments. His email can. is cheech at flyfishfood.com. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Okay. Is that it? I think that's it. All right. I got to go shave my back. Oh, <laughs> oh man. <laughs> Gross. End of story. Gross. Out. <laughs>